Well, good morning again. Glad you're all here with us today. I know we have some visitors today, so I want to help catch you up to speed on where we are and what we're doing. We've been working our way through the Gospel of John this year. Uh, We won't finish this year, but we started this year. And uh, we're working our way through kind of verse by verse, section by section. And uh, next week, Brandon is going to be finishing up chapter 9. I'm going to be doing chapter 9, verses 24 to 34 today. Uh, But I want to recap real quickly where we've been in this chapter so far. Uh, We began by looking at Jesus stepping into this situation where he heals the blind man, and we saw that he brings this transformation to the situation, right? He moves, moves from religion to relief, moves from watching to working, from stationary to sent, and finally from confusion to clarity. And as we saw in the next section, the, the way that the transformation works itself out practically is we see that uh, Jesus and the blind man working through him begin to create uh, this, this confrontation with traditions. Where traditions are confronted, the authority of Jesus and the testimony of the blind man confront the traditions that were in place. And then... Today, what we're going to see in this section of Scripture that we're going to look at is we're going to see how when this happens, this this process of transformation into confronting traditions brings about a boldness that that only comes through Christ. And, and, And this boldness is rooted in Christ. And so we've been studying the Gospel of John to learn about Jesus. We want to know more about him, and as we know more about him, it helps us to be able to navigate life and relationships. And this is a great way for us to learn about Jesus and then learn like, when I know that, great, but how does that affect the way that I live? How does that affect the way that I navigate life? So that's kind of the idea. That's the big picture of where we're going today. I'm going to pray and then we'll read some scripture together. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for today. And again, that theme, Lord, has just been that you meet us where we are, but we praise you because you don't leave us there. And so, God, today, as we see how this boldness rooted in Christ manifests in us, uh, would you just help each one of us to grow in that? Help each one of us to understand that we can have a boldness that's rooted in a confidence that comes from you. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to read John 9, 24 to 34, and I'll be reading from the ESV. You can listen along, or if you want to follow along, feel free to do that. So for the second time they called the man who had been been blind and said to him, Give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered, Whether he is a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. They said to him, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I have told you already, and you would not listen. Why? Do you want to hear it again? Do you want to also do you also want to become his disciple? And they reviled him, saying, You are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses. But as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, Why is this an amazing thing? You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. But if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, You were born in utter sin, and you would teach us, and they cast him out. That's our section of scripture that we're going to cover today. And the concept, the core of this, the word that I'm going to, last week I put the word tradition in front of you. Today I want to put the word boldness in front of you. And I have a question. How many of you, by show of hands, have ever prayed for boldness? Prayed for boldness. Lord, Give me a boldness today. Give me a boldness in my interactions. All of us, right? And I think today is a great section of Scripture to see what does that boldness look like and where does it come from. So let's remember this guy. He was, in the earlier weeks, remember we, we said that this guy was a fixture, that he was, had been born blind and that he was the man that was a beggar. He was like, we said he was like a landmark that people would use when they were giving directions, that he was a fixture there. Now he's standing before the Pharisees. And we've talked about this a little bit, but the Pharisees, they're a big deal, right? They hold all the power. They're kind of in charge of everything. They're the ones that, that know all of the 613 laws that everybody had to follow. 
They were the ones that made all the decisions. So, so now this, this man who was a landmark to give directions off of because he was always in the same spot begging is standing in front of them for the second time. Why, why can he so boldly proclaim what happened to him in front of these people that have all the power? I think that the, que- the answer to that question is found all the way back in verse 3. So if you're looking at your, your Bible right now, I want you to go back to verse 3 and let's read this. John, Jesus answered, It was not this man who sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. So think about this. When we read that verse, especially when we just think of this chapter as a whole, we think of what that is talking about as the works of God being displayed in him is Jesus putting mud on his eyes and healing his blindness. And that's absolutely, yes, that is the work of God happening in him. But there's more to it. The work of God doesn't stop when his blindness is healed. It continues. The work of God continues in him. It doesn't stop with the healing. It continues as he's transformed to a place where he's able to be bold in front of these people who have all of the power. And this is important for us to see because I just asked you guys a question. And if you've been around a little bit, you know that when I ask you questions, I'm using, usually setting you up for something, right? Okay? So many of us said that we have prayed for boldness. So how many of you know that when you pray for something like boldness, you don't just get uh, infused with a, a dose of boldness that you can just carry around with you. What you get instead is opportunities to be bold. You pray for boldness, you get opportunities to be bold. When you pray for patience, you get opportunities to be patient. Be careful what you pray for. But this is what I'm trying to point out here. When you pray for boldness, when you pray for patience, when you pray, Lord, make me love more, you get opportunities to be bold, to have patience, to love. That's what you get when you pray for these things. And you get these opportunities, and when you start to see this boldness developing in you, or the patience, this is the work of God being displayed in you. God is working that in you. As you pray for things like boldness and you are given opportunities to be bold and you see and feel boldness from the Holy Spirit, that is the work of God happening in you. Do you see that connection? That's why I'm saying the answer to this is in verse 3. The works of God didn't stop when the blindness was gone. So we're going to look at three ways that this boldness shows up in the life of the blind man and then uh, we're going to see the works of God displayed in him in this boldness. So number one, uh, if you're taking notes on your bulletin or in your app, is boldness and testimony. Boldness and testimony. This has been a big theme for the last three weeks, this idea of testimony. Verses 24 to 25, you can read those for yourself. The wording of the Pharisees is is good for us to stop and look at right here. Uh, This phrase, give glory to God. It's a phrase that, that... would be used to swear someone in. Like if the Pharisees were calling somebody to come and talk to them about something and they say this, give glory to God. That's kind of like you know us saying, put your right hand on the Bible and repeat after me in a courtroom, right? So give glory to God. It's a phrase that, uh, that we've seen before. Uh, if you think back to the story of the Israelites when they're coming into the promised land and, and God is kind of giving all of their enemies into their hands and he tells them, now don't, this is all devoted And this is a whole, we have another video on this, but this is all devoted to destruction, okay? And so that's a hard one for people to wrap their heads around. But God has told them, I'm giving you this, but don't take any of the spoils for yourself, right? This is not for you. This is to be devoted to destruction. Leave it all there. And they're coming off of this huge victory in Jericho. And so they go to this small little town called Ai, And they only say, they said, we don't need to send all those guys. Just send a few thousand guys. It's not that big of a deal. It's a little town. Just God's given us all of of our enemies into our hands. So we'll send this little group. They get defeated. And they come back and they're going, what happened? 
how did we get defeated in this tiny little town? We just took out Jericho. And so they're, they're narrowing it down, narrowing it down, and then finally we get to Joshua 7, 19. Joshua says to Achan, he brings this man in front of him, and he says, my son, give glory to the Lord God of Israel and give him praise and tell me now what you have done. Do not hide it from me. It's the equivalent of swearing in with your hand on the Bible. When Joshua finally gets to the point where he brings this man in front of him, he's saying, okay, this is all the time for cover-ups, all the time for trying to pass this off. That's over. Give glory to God. Let's tell the truth here. This is getting serious. The pressure on the blind man is being ratcheted up. Okay? So far they've been asking him questions, but now they're making it official. Now they're getting serious. They're saying, no, no, no. Give glory to God. What happened? So the blind man's answer gives more glory to God than they were ready for. He gives the plain answer to the question. He testifies boldly about the works of God in his life. He puts the works of God on display with his boldness in testimony. And it's one of the most recognizable lines of a hymn around. I was blind, now I see. This is the most glory that he gives to God beyond what they were hoping for. And when we sing that song and we sing that line, not all of us have the experience of not being able to see at some point in our life. But we sing that line with a bunch of excitement, don't we? When we sing that song... We love that line, I was blind, but now I see. Because we know that it was like when we were spiritually blind and we come to Christ and it's as if now all of a sudden we see all the spiritual work that's happening around us. We see the way that God has been working in our lives and continues to work in our lives. It's like we were blind, but now we can see. And that's why we can sing that with such excitement. So relate this to your own situation. Think about the works of God displayed in your life. Think about that. When you have the opportunity to talk to people you knew before you met the Lord, do you have a boldness in testimony? Do you have a boldness in testimony? Look at the example that the blind man gave it. It doesn't mean that you have to have a doctorate in theology to give a boldness in the testimony of what God has done in you. Like the previously blind man saying, I was blind, now I see. The boldness of testimony in the face of these people in power. So can you boldly testify of the work of God in your life? Now a side note. I want to talk real quickly about the difference between boldness and jerkiness. Okay? Not like beef jerky. Okay? I'm talking about jerkiness. How many of you have ever... No, we're not going to do it. Okay. Here's the difference. This is a litmus test you can use for yourself as you boldly testify about the works of God in your life. So this is for yourself, not for the person that you came with or the one you wish was here today. Boldness, boldness shows humility and it points to Jesus, okay? Boldness states the facts of the situation. Boldness helps others understand that you are sure of what happened. Boldness, this is important, boldness puts the works of God on display, okay? Jerkiness puts you in a place of superiority because of what has happened. Okay? Jerkiness leaves you some room for embellishment. Okay? Jerkiness puts you on display. We need to be bold as Christians in our testimony, not jerks. Number two, the second way that we see this boldness appear is boldness in identity. Boldness in identity, verses 26 through 29. And, you know, anytime we use the word identity nowadays, we know that this is a buzzword, right? So you can hardly say the word identity without people getting worked up. And that's not what I'm talking about today, here and now. 
here's, here's the comfort for us when we see this boldness and identity show up. And remember the difference throughout this whole message now between boldness and jerkiness, okay? We have a lot of ways that we identify ourselves, don't we? Depending on the, the crowd we're in or the, the situation that we're in, we're, maybe we're identified as a husband, a wife, a mother, a father, a school bus driver, a teacher, a student, a butcher, a baker, a candlestick maker, whatever it is, right? Okay? You get the idea. We have a lot of words and ways that we use to identify ourselves depending on our context. The previously blind man identifies himself as a disciple of Christ in these verses. That's how he identifies himself. Look at the way that he included himself. Verse 27, why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? It's about recognizing the newness of life that we find in Christ. He realizes that his identity is different now. His identity is different. Sinner to saint. That's what Peter was, was saying when he, uh, when he said this in 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. He's talking about the transformation that happens in our identities when we move from death to life, when we move from being an enemy of God to a child of God. Your identity is different. Your identity changes. He says in this, right before that, that we're living stones that are being built up into a spiritual house. And I've said this before, you're stones with stories. Your stones with stories. The boldness of your story is rooted in the boldness of your identity in Christ. That's where that comes from. So when people say, no, 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 I, re- I know you. I know you. I remember all that stuff we used to do together. You're a drunk. No, no, no. I remember all of our talks. You're a gossip. No, 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 no. You, were, you used to share all your secrets with me. I know what you are. I know all of it. You get to have the boldness that the blind man had to say, no, that was me. I'm not denying that that was me. I used to be blind. Now I see. I used to be blind, now I see. I used to be those things. All of those things that you just said, I was those things. Now I am a child of God. Now that is what my identity is. It's the boldness of identity that you can say, that you can say what, what Paul said in Ephesians 2, 4, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love which he, he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised up with him and seated with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. You can say, I was those things. Now I am seated in heavenly places. So the question for you, what's your identity? What's your identity? Are you like the blind man, able to identify yourselves as a disciple of Christ? We have four people who are going to be making this public declaration after the service today in their baptism. It's the boldness in our identity in Christ that changes us. It stops us from identifying with our past sin. That's not who you are anymore if you're in Christ. A boldness in identity stops you from identifying as that. And it has us boldly identifying as a child of God. Saved, forgiven, redeemed. This is how we're able to interact as an ambassador for Christ. This is how we bring the aroma of Jesus with us when we go about our daily lives. We have to have boldness in our identity in Christ in order to allow the works of God to be displayed in us. 
The third way that we see boldness in this section of text is boldness in consequences. Boldness in consequences. And this is verses 30 through 34. So the first two points, just being honest, that was kind of the rah-rah part of this message. Okay? That's the... Uh, that's the, what you feel like you came here for today. That's the get me, get me fired up, get me fueled up, feed me to go on through my week. Uh, but this is where it starts to get real, when we start to see the consequences. At this point, this man has boldly testified about what Jesus has done in his life. He's boldly identified himself with Jesus. So if we're making this a little more personal, now we have identified ourselves in Christ. We've been bold about sharing that. And now you boldly move into the consequences of that decision. You might be saying, wait a minute. Wait a minute. You just, you just pulled the bait and switch on me here. You just pulled the bait and switch on me because you just told me a whole bunch of stuff about what I'm not identified with anymore and that I can be bold in that. Yes. And just like everything we do in life, there are consequences. Maybe you're thinking, wait a minute. Someone told me that when I come to faith in Christ that everything gets fixed. That everything gets better. That I'm going to be healthy, wealthy, wise. Right? Maybe some of you were told that. I apologize if you are. That's not the truth. That is not the gospel message. That's actually the opposite of the gospel message. We've already seen Jesus. I'm pretty sure Jesus is clear on the gospel. Okay, We've already seen in the book of John, we've seen Jesus take his ministry from 15,000 people who followed him across a lake. 15,000 to 12, not 12,000, 12 people by saying, I am it. I am what you need to sustain life spiritually. That you can keep eating bread and drinking and you will die but if you eat and drink me, you will live forever. And he went from 15,000 to 12. Not 12,000, 12. When he gave them the gospel message. That this is not about the things that you want or think you need here and now. That this is about eternity. Jesus has never been playing the numbers game. He's playing the disciple game. He's looking for disciples, people who are following him. And when we follow Jesus, things will get tough. You're going to meet resistance just like the blind man met. Maybe some of you are meeting that resistance right now. In fact, this is the clear message of all of Scripture. In Matthew 5, 11, and 12, he's, Jesus is telling us that we're going to be blessed when we're persecuted for Christ's sake. When Paul writes to the Philippian church, from prison... Okay? He wasn't on the beach when he wrote this letter. He's in prison, and he writes this letter that's, there's joy dripping out of this letter. He writes from prison. He tells him in chapter 1 that as we live out the Christian life, we, we will not only believe, but we will suffer as we are engaged in the spread of the gospel. How's that for a gospel message? Yeah, you're going to believe, but you're going to suffer as you are living a life that's engaged in spreading the gospel. When he wrote to Timothy in his second letter, he's saying that, hey, as things progress here in this world, it's going to get hard. You're going to have problems. He's saying that, that people are going to get so focused on themselves that they want to get their way in everything. Then he tells him this, in 2 Timothy 3, verse 12, Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus... Does anybody here desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus? Okay, I'm going to finish the verse now. We'll be persecuted. <laughs> the blind man, the blind man in this chapter is experiencing this because he's cast out. He is now removed from the synagogue. We talked about this a little bit last week. That's the hub of everything. 
That's the hub of everything. And we talked about this a little bit in my small group. What's this guy going to do? Like, he can't go back and beg now. He's not blind anymore. He, he lost his job when he got healed. He lost his job when he became a disciple of Christ. And now he's kicked out of what is not just the religious hub, but it's the economic hub. It's the social hub of where he lives. He has now lost everything by declaring, do you want to be his disciples too? His whole life has changed, but so has his eternal destination. That's the encouragement for us, that yes, there are consequences for our faith. There are consequences for our faith. There will be people that don't want to be around you anymore, that loved being around you before you came to Christ. There will be people who want to throw the past at you. There's going to be people that purposely bait you into vain arguments just to yank on your chain, just to stir the pot, just to, just to, just to have an aha moment to say, see, see, I knew that was still in there. So they can say that you're not acting very Christian. But there's other consequences for our faith too. This is where the encouragement is. Your sins are forgiven. You feel the release of the burdens that weighed you down. Your eternal destination changes from punishment in hell to eternal communion with Jesus in heaven. So the question in this boldness and consequences, if we're going to have boldness in the consequences of our faith, is how do we get through these hard times here and now? Because that's what we want to know, right? Like, I've talked to a lot of you. We're looking forward to heaven. But we're going through it right now. We're here. We look to our hope. We look to our hope. We look to that relief. The relief that we know is coming. We look at that forgiveness. And I would say we live in that forgiveness. We find joy in suffering because in that suffering... We are brought closer and closer to Jesus. As we suffer, we're brought closer and closer to Jesus. Because just like Peter, just like Peter, we get to this point where we say, Lord, to whom else should we go? Where else should we go? And for many of us, we can say, we've already been to all those places. Where else should we go? Today can be that day for you. Today can be that day that you recognize that you're separated from God. Today can be the day that that you recognize you're separated from a holy God because of your sin. And that God provided in his son and his sacrificial death on the cross the forgiveness that we can move into, that we accept. We, We recognize our sin for what it is. We turn away from it in repentance and we turn towards the finished work of Christ on the cross. And it changes our testimony, it changes our identity, and it changes the consequences. Because I've said this a million times from up here, we all defaultly stand in a position of judgment. We read past John 3.16 and get to 3.18 and it says you're already condemned because you haven't believed. You don't start in the middle. There is no middle. You start condemned because of sin and you move to saved, not through your own works, through the finished work of Christ on the cross. That's the gospel. And that's what we're going to celebrate, these four folks that are going to come up and make that public display, that public confession uh, that I've decided to follow Jesus. I'm going to have the worship team come up. If you are one of those folks that are going to be involved in the baptism right after, you can head to the, to the backstage area, or if you're going to go change, now's a good time to do that. But let's sing, let's praise the Lord, let's thank Him, let's be bold in our praise, let's be bold in our worship. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for today. Thank you for the way that we've watched you, even in this chapter, work through this this healing event, and that we see that 
Your work doesn't stop at salvation, but it continues to work through us through sanctification and unto glorification. And so we thank you for that. And God, I pray that each one of us would take that step today, that as we pray for boldness, we recognize those opportunities to be bold, and that we can be bold in you and for you. In Jesus' name, amen.